mentioned fish farm, farms earlier. What are the pros and cons of fish farms? Fish farms are interesting because on the one hand, they can provide a source of protein in some areas at, at relatively low costs. I think fish farms on land in particular are um, able to produce herbivorous fish, vegetarian fish, um, fairly low cost and can improve a, a source of protein in people's diets who might not otherwise have it. Uh, much of the fish that we in richer Western countries tend to, to like to buy say our farmed salmon or farmed shrimp, have been found to have a number of negative environmental impacts. Uh, and it starts from shrimp and, and salmon. They're not vegetarian fish, so they, they need to eat other fish or, or high quality sources of protein to survive. Um, and so what we were doing is catching uh, fish in the ocean, some of the smaller fish, menhaden or krill or other things, to grind up into to fish meal to then feed to these fish we have in pens and farms. And um, it could take something like nine pounds of fish meal to grow one pound of weight on salmon. So that's not an efficient use of our, our resources. Now, um, a lot of salmon farmers are, are sensitive to this and they're trying to reduce the amount of wild fish they need in their feed to grow, to grow salmon um, more environmentally responsible, but, but by and large, it's, it's, not, it's not a very efficient use of resources. Shrimp farms um, often are being built in coastal areas, which has meant uh, cutting down mangrove forests on, co on coasts and to create these um, pens for, these pens for shrimp. Um, and both shrimp farms, salmon farms, a lot of the, the farms happening in coastal areas, it's a way to concentrate a lot of animals in one place. When you do that, you have a lot of waste. Um, so that's, that's caused problems for the, the, local, um, the local marine environment. If you concentrate a lot of fish waste in one place, you get algae blooms. Then that ends up um, decreasing the amount of oxygen in local areas in the water. So you can create these ox low oxygen, so-called dead zones. Um, so that's another problem associated with, with, coastal, with coastal fish farms. What are the pros and cons of nuclear energy? Nuclear energy is um, a very hot topic. I'd say at the very basic level, Nuclear energy is extraordinarily expensive. Building a new nuclear uh, power plant costs billions of dollars, um, not including what you would spend on the fuel to run it, but just the, the amount of um, cement concrete you need to build the structure. Um, and so even when you ignore all the environmental issues for economics alone, nuclear energy is just not competitive. Um, solar, wind, um, even natural gas are far, far lower cost ways to, to produce energy than to build a new nuclear power plant. Um, the world is already uh, past the point where we're peak nuclear energy. The, the heyday for building nuclear power plants was decades ago and such. We're, we're facing a, a grow, an aging fleet of nuclear power plants. Many of the power plants, nuclear power plants are at the, around the 40 year mark, which is where they were originally rated for their lifespans. And so now uh, we have to face the question of decommissioning nuclear power plants, um, which is again, enormously costly. And what do we do with the waste? Um, no state wants a nuclear waste depository uh, on, on their land. Um, nobody wants nuclear waste going on trains passing through their communities. Um, so we still haven't solved the waste problem. And then of course there's fears of, of meltdowns or disasters as we saw most recently in 2011 in Japan where there was an earthquake and the tsunami that ended up uh, triggering a meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear reactor. And for years the local waters there were be being contaminated by nuclear waste. So Japan, one of the, the world's most industrially advanced societies, that they 
have not been able to, to deal well with this disaster, I think raises fear in a number of people's minds. And in fact, um, after that disaster, um, countries became more aggressive, um, particularly European countries on their move to phase out nuclear power. But I would say even before the Fukushima disaster, nuclear um, energy was already on a downturn, and that's largely because of the economics. How many countries would you classify as a failing state? Uh, how many were there, say, 20 years ago or 10 years ago uh, versus today, and how many do you expect to be there in the next several years moving forward? Yeah, failing states is a, a difficult conundrum for the international community. Um, Foreign Policy Magazine and the Fund for Peace put out a annual ranking, ranking their failed states or their um, fragile states list where they rank every country in the world as to how, how well their government is performing. And, and the reason we're looking at this is historically, the biggest fear was the concentration of power in countries, right? Countries would become too powerful and that could disrupt economic order. I think now the fear in the international uh, community is a power vacuum. What happens when a country's government loses legitimacy, when it can no longer provide basic services to its people? Um, so if you look at the, the Fund for Peace foreign policy list, they have rank some of their most fragile states, um, a number of African countries, Sudan, South Sudan, fall into that list, Somalia, um, Uganda, uh, where there's, there's much political turmoil. And, and who's in that, that, <laughs> that most fragile list you know, ch changes somewhat year to year. But um, if you were to draw a world map and, and paint the, the state, the, the countries, uh, different colors based on the security. I think you see Africa tends to be much in the red alert, orange um, area, m many African countries. Uh, and then you could ask the question, what is, a, what is a failed state? If it's just the ability to stay in a, a government, you know, <laughs> what does that mean for the United States where we recently had our government shut down and um, unable to work recently? Um, I think it's, it's a problem um, we need to look at, and, and there's a number of things that, uh, common factors in failed states that probably are not getting enough attention. Um, and the main one, I think, is demographic. One of the characteristics in many of these failing states that, has, that they have in common is that they have very rapid population growth rates. And that puts strains on all sorts of systems, any kind of resource you want to have, um, housing, infrastructure. How do you cope with a country that's growing at 2 or 3% a year? That doesn't sound like much, but that leads to a doubling of population um, relatively rapidly. Um, so in order to address the problem of failing states, I think we need to pay much more attention to, to demographic factors. Thank you.